The City Below the Cloud by T. S. Galindo Read by the Author Chapter 2 The Task The rain had subsided by the time Kalin reached the task terminal. The number of people had thinned to a manageable swarm, but it still took her much longer than usual to get there. Crowd densities followed patterns. Those not bound by timing schedules had learned to avoid them. She cursed the broken task coordinator for waking her up when it did, throwing off her timing. The city spread across the ground like an infection, from a mine at the base of a mountain. The mine was a gaping wound in the earth where people extracted minerals and other precious materials. The city mostly consisted of refineries and processing plants. Everything not directly linked to the mine was in service of keeping it running. There were just enough available resources to house and feed the people to keep a working population, lest production fall short. Work shifts in the mine switched at the cycle changes, meaning there were large groups of people getting on the large elevators to go down, and worn-out people returning from a full cycle of work. Thus, the crowds were most extreme just before and after the start of a cycle. Kaylin's work wasn't based on schedules, so she could choose her own hours though she still had to compete with the other scrubbers for available tasks. Any tasks, including working in the mines or refineries, paid just enough to get someone through a cycle or less. It was impossible to store up any significant amount of charge, the currency of the city. When groups of people tried to pool their resources, there still wasn't enough to make a difference. Groups were just as economically vulnerable, sometimes more so, than individuals, causing people to become isolated. For most inhabitants of the city, the norm was isolation and paranoia. Kaylin placed her defective task coordinator in the terminal, claiming the job for herself. A compartment opened on the side of the machine containing the necessary tools, a mobile platform, a scrub brush, and a pair of glasses fitted with augmented reality displays. She collected the items and put the glasses on, which showed her where the job site was. Good, it's just across the street. The terminals weren't always close to the task. She often had to haul the heavy platform several blocks. She navigated through the dwindling crowd and set up the platform. The tiny tendrils on the omnidirectional treads reached out and gripped the concrete wall as if alive. Once attached, it straightened itself out and performed a dance-like calibration routine. She sat down and gripped the sides as it jolted upward and began ascending the building. Occasionally, the treads would slip on the lichen and rarely, they'd lose grip entirely. This had never happened to her, but she'd seen the wreckages and known people who'd been unlucky. Despite the looming possibility of death, this was Kaylin's favorite part of being a scrubber. She loved watching the city descend below her, and she loved the rare opportunity to be alone in a city so densely populated. The ever-present feeling of threat fell away the further she got from the river of strangers. The sounds of the streets reverberated distantly around her with a haunting, unreal quality. Not being part of the constant motion of the crowds gave her a dysphoric sense of stillness despite the fact that she was literally moving with the platform. Up there, she was alone and important. Her world was at once the vast open air between the buildings, stretching as far as the cloud allowed her to see, and the limited domain of the tiny platform. She watched the people below. Most wore large, ill-fitting raincoats pieced together from scraps of vinyl on top of worn, mismatched garments or draped fabric. Everyone had bald or shaved heads to reduce the risk of lice. Many were covered in dirt and mud from the mines, or colored mineral residue from the refineries. Most had prosthetics of some kind, typically a hand or arm. Eyes were also common. Legs were harder to come by. If someone needed a leg prosthetic, they rarely lasted long enough to find a replacement. Skin color had become a spectrum between charcoal black and chalk white. The lack of sunlight and the heavy environmental impact of the mined minerals and refinery exhaust had changed how people's skin pigment expressed themselves. The extremes of the color range were pretty rare. Most skin was within a small range of grays. This allowed other attributes to be a larger distinguishing factor such as how rough or smooth, how moist or dry, or how varied or consistent the gradients were. 
The change took many generations, but it eliminated most skin color-based prejudices in the city below the cloud. As she was carried further upward, she started to lose sight of individuals. Only the lights were visible now. To supplement the light from the neon signs, people carried small handheld lights and threaded glow wire into their clothes. From above, it was a swirling river of light flowing through the black voids of the buildings with the signs on the walls drifting like neon phantoms haunting the streets. The platform stopped at an air vent on the building. Normally, the vent was a large round tube jutting from the concrete. It had been covered over with a net of branching tube-like lichen thick enough to prevent airflow. She began to gather her materials when she heard a commotion from the street below. The doors of the building across from her burst open and someone was thrown into the stream of passers-by, knocking several over. Bright light flooded the street through the doorway. Caitlin ducked low on the platform, clinging to the edges, while she watched the person pulling something from inside their jacket. A gun? What an idiot! Everyone knows you never touch a gun. The Enforcer robots are going to get you for sure. Here they come. Three two-and-a-half-meter-tall figures walked out of the building. The two on the sides emitted blinding light, flooding the entire street. The robots were slim torsos with broad shoulders and thumb-width rods for arms and legs that ended in points. They had no heads and seamless chrome bodies. They walked toward the panicking person in the street with unnaturally slow, smooth, and deliberate movements. The person pointed the gun at the robots and shot repeatedly while screaming in terror. Their face was covered in tears and their voice came out in sobbing stops and starts. Kalen flinched at the dull, echoing explosions. What are you doing? Run! The two bullets that hit the center robot bounced off, leaving no marks or evidence of an attack. The robot didn't respond. It just kept slowly lumbering toward them. Kaylin watched the scene through the wires of the graded platform. Her body shook and cold sweat beaded over her skin. It's too late. Where'd you even find a gun? You should have just run. She held her breath as the robot approached the shooter in the street. They hadn't tried to stand or flee. The two outer robots moved to either side of them. The light only shone from the front of their bodies, creating a surreal image from Kaylin's vantage point. Two cones of light blasting toward each other with the crisp shadow of the opposite robot smeared across the street in either direction. The shooter sat huddled in the fetal position, drenched in shadowless light, weeping. The center robot stood ominously still over them, balanced on the points of its disproportionately thin legs. Kaylin's entire body was shaking with fear. She didn't dare breathe. As she watched the terrifying scene below, she saw a tall figure with a hooded, opaque jacket standing at the corner of the building, staring up at her. She couldn't see their face, but they were clearly more interested in her than the robots. The center robot reached one of its long arms toward the shooter's head. The tip of its arm rapidly grew longer, piercing their skull, and then retracting back. The huddled figure unfolded backward and flopped onto the street, motionless. The robot retrieved the pistol from the body while the light from the two side robots vanished creating a vacuum of darkness. Then all three robots walked in perfect unison down the street, turned the corner, and disappeared. Kaylin continued to peer through the mesh of the platform while she waited for the adrenaline to fizzle out of her system. She watched as the people below began to go about their lives as if nothing had happened. The flow of bodies enveloped the street again. Where'd the body go? I didn't see any glow punks. They're usually the ones to dispose of the bodies. And where'd the creep who was watching me go? Maybe down that alley? Maybe they were thinking of waiting for me to finish the job and rob my charge when I claimed it? I'll watch my back when I'm done. Most often, people didn't have enough on them to make trying to rob them worthwhile. As soon as someone got any amount of charge, it was almost immediately spent on food or a unit. Typically, all someone owned was on their person, mostly consisting of enough clothes to keep them dry and warm. If someone knew someone was about to get some charge, they might be willing to try to steal it, however. Everyone in the city also carried a stun baton. It was their primary, and often only, protection. The real danger was desperation. One failed attempt to gain enough charge to afford shelter or the barely nourishing food started a quick decline into exhaustion and starvation. Deprived of food or sleep, a person's drive to survive pushed aside their rationality 
and everyone became a target, despite having nothing to steal. The stun batons made short work of those eminently needy people in favor of the momentarily more fortunate. Kaelin eventually calmed down enough to start working. She strapped the mask on over the AR glasses. She had removed it when the rain slowed. Most masks were little more than filter cloths stretched over the mouth, but Kaelin's was special equipment for scrubbers. It covered her whole face with a large clear plastic shield and had a second smaller mask inside, which molded around her nose and mouth. A large cylindrical filter housing attached to the front. She changed the filters often to make sure she didn't inhale anything unwanted, even beyond the acid rain. When someone got too close to certain mushrooms, they would release a large cloud of spores as a kind of defense. Most people never got close enough for this to be a hazard, but for scrubbers it was a constant threat. Direct exposure to a cloud of spores would suffocate someone. Once inhaled, there was no way to extract them in time. Even minor contaminations of spores could be fatal. They would grow inside a victim's lungs or skin, eating them slowly from the inside out. The plastic coverall suit was to prevent these or any other types of contamination. She surveyed the vent. The lichen doesn't spore, so I'm safe there. It looks fairly young, so it shouldn't hold too tight. The edges of the pipe are nice and sharp, too. I can scrub over that and kind of cut it off the hole. She started to scrub, separating the lichen. Hmm, even as young as it is, it's really easy to get off. The roots are barely gripping. When she finished, there was a round slab of lichen that had covered the opening. She rolled it up to throw in the reclamator for an extra bit of charge. The tough chitin that makes up fungal cell walls made it difficult to break down, so the reclamators didn't give much charge for fungal material. That didn't take long at all. I might be able to get in an extra two jobs this cycle if I keep up this pace. She backed up carefully and swept the site with her eyes to let the AR glasses see the job was done. A blue light flashed on the peripherals of her vision, indicating successful completion of the task. She ducked down and grabbed the edges fast as the platform started retreating toward the ground. Once down, she detached the platform and looked to make sure the creep wasn't around, and she made her way over to the terminal. The terminal would only give her her power chip, or PIP, if she returned all the tools and the same task coordinator. She inserted the coordinator, put the tools back in their compartment, and dumped the lichen biomatter into the attached reclamator. Then she got her pip. She grabbed one of the other task coordinators on the terminal to replace the broken one, and quickly made her way through the crowd, gripping the handle of her stun baton and looking around for the creep. I don't see them. Maybe they're waiting for me to get relaxed. Or maybe they're gone. I better go a few blocks just to be safe. I can lose them in the crowd. She faded into the stream of bodies, wary of everyone around her. Once she was sure she wasn't being followed, she leaned against a building and looked for another task on the new coordinator.